Welcome to NWATC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh. I'd like to turn it over to Christian Ramers to introduce our guest. Great. Well, it's great to have John Scott. I don't think he really needs much introduction. John has led the effort here at the University of Washington for Project ECHO. John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. And so last week we talked about the natural history and diagnosis of uh, hepatitis C in the context of HIV, and this week we're going to talk about treatment. And so just to outline the talk, we're going to uh, go over the definitions of viral response uh, and then move on to the standard of care, uh, what are the FDA-approved therapies for hepatitis C in the context of HIV, and then move on to more of the um, emerging areas of directly acting antivirals in HIV hep C. So that's DAAs, kind of our analog of ARVs, our heart. Um, so all these abbreviations you'll have to get used to. Um, and here's a, a whole list of abbreviations to get started. So when you put a person on hepatitis C treatment, we follow the viral load uh, pretty closely, just like you do with HIV. But there are certain time points that we're really interested in because they have a, a highly prognostic information. The first time you want to check is the four weeks, so four weeks after starting hepatitis C treatment. And if the viral load is completely un <coughs> undetectable, at four weeks, we call that a rapid virologic response, or RVR. And then if you check again at 12 weeks, they're still undetectable. We call that an extended RVR, or ERVR. Uh, when we were using interferon and ribavirin uh, just by themselves, we would uh, check at 12 weeks. And we were shooting for a two-log decline, so a hundred-fold dec dec uh, decline in their uh, viral load. And if they made, met that mark, then they were called an early virologic responder. Now that kind of comes in a, a, uh, two flavors. If they're completely negative um, at 12 weeks, we call that a complete EVR. But if there's still a little bit of virus at 12 weeks and they eventually go, um, and they are still detectable by week 24, we call it a partial EVR. Uh, the next time you want to check is at the end of treatment. And if they're negative then, we call it an end of treatment response. And then the, really the gold standard, the thing that we're really shooting for is something called the sustained virologic response, or SVR. This is an undetectable hepatitis C viral load 24 weeks after the end of treatment. And this is really, in my book, synonymous with a, with a cure. So in my books, SVR equals cure. And then a non-response is a failure to achieve undetectability at any time during the treatment. So one of the really key concepts with hepatitis C treatment is that the genotype matters. Um, in the United States, we're seeing mostly genotypes 1, 2, and 3, with genotype 1 accounting for about 3 quarters of our patients, as she's seen here in red. And then the next most common are genotype 2s and 3s. And the reason why genotype matters is that genotype 1 is the most common. It's also the most difficult to cure. Twos and threes tend to be what we call the low-hanging fruit, much higher cure rates, and I'll be showing you the data on that. And then the uh, genotypes four, five, and six are pretty uncommon. Uh, genotype four is, is, as you mentioned, remember from last week, is pretty common in East Africa and Egypt, and it acts more like a genotype one, whereas the genotype six is uh, more common in Southeast Asia and acts more like a genotype two. Genotype five is exceedingly rare. I've never seen it. It's pretty much in um, Southern Africa and uh, it acts somewhere between a, a 1 and a 2. So we've made quite a bit of progress in the treatment of hepatitis C. Um, we started using standard interferon back in the late 80s, early 90s, and had about a 5% cure rate. And then starting in the, the late 90s, started using combination of interferon and ribavirin, by getting cure rates in the 40%. And, and then uh, in 2002, had a new class of interferons called pegylate interferon, which is a sustained release form of interferon. We, you see we've got cure rates of around 50, 55 percent in HIV negative patients. And then the, the next leap forward was last year in 2011 when we had a new class of drugs. Uh, we call them protease inhibitors. Um, I think it's a little bit confusing in this context when we're talking about HIV, so um, that's why I like to use the term uh, directly acting antivirals. But these are NS3, NS4 uh, inhibitors and uh, got cure rates around 70 percent. So what about in our uh, co-infected patients? This is data that's now about seven or eight years old, um, looking at the treatment of gene type 1 patients with pegylate interferon. And what this data shows in across three different studies is that gene type 1 patients had around a 15 to 30 percent cure rate. Uh, and those twos and threes, remember the low-hanging fruit, cure rates anywhere from 44 to 73 percent. 
Um, and these were all patients treated with a whole year of therapy. So a big difference in the cure rates there. And also a big difference, there was a big difference in the cure rates compared to the HIV negative. Around, it was lagging about 15 and 20 percent compared to the HIV negative population. So there are a couple of things that we can use to predict response before um, starting treatment. The first, as I mentioned, is gene type 1. So that's just our harder to treat virus. Uh, the second is a high viral load, and we usually use a cut up of 800,000 IU per ml. Uh, anything over that is considered a little bit harder to treat. The more advanced the fibrosis on an uh, uh, individual patient, the harder it is to treat, particularly uh, stage 3 and stage 4, or so our, our pre cirrhosis or cirrhosis. African Americans have um, traditionally been very difficult to cure, and for a long reason, for a long time, we didn't know why, but uh, in the last two, three years, we figured out there's actually a genetic um, uh, region called IL-28, which is strongly predictive of a patient um, responding to treatment, and most African Americans have uh, the so-called bad genotype there. This is a commercially available test that you can now do for around $200 or $300. Um, then other issues are steatosis, or fat on the liver, and obesity, and metabolic syndrome are these are all adverse predictors. So the currently FDA-approved um, uh, drugs for hepatitis C and HIV positive are pegylated interferon, alpha, 2A, and ribavirin. Um, there are two kind of pegylated interferons, um, uh, 2A and 2B, but only 2A is actually FDA-approved. Um, so that's a key point. They, um, 2B, which is also known as pegintron, has, there's no data on HIV positive patients. The other key point I want to make is that um, you got to treat both your genotype 1s and your 2s and 3s for a total of 48 weeks. So uh, unfortunately, this is not an easy treatment to take. Um, you can just ask Dave uh, Hashi and, and others who have been doing this for a while um, that uh, this has a lot of side effects. Um, the most common thing is that they just feel like they have the flu, uh, so they get low-grade fevers. Uh, aches and pains, especially right after the interferon injection. Cytopenia, so white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets can all go down. We need to keep a close eye on them. And then I think what's really relevant for our population is depression, anxiety, insomnia. That usually shows up um, around uh, month two or month three. Rashes do occur. Uh, thyroid dysfunction is more of an autoimmune process that can be activated. Retinopathy, particularly in patients who have diabetes or hypertension. Nausea, vomit, diarrhea, and a kind of a ACE inhibitor-like cough. It's just a dry cough. It can be kind of irritating. Uh, so those are all things you would need to um, watch out for in a patient on interferon. So in summary, the, the standard HCV therapy is pegylated interferon, alpha 2A, and ribavirin. Uh, the gene type 1 is hardest to treat, and 2 and 3s have much better treatment response rates. The main uh, side effects are hematologic, psychiatric, and what we call constitutional. And there are a lot of factors that can be useful to predict response before we even start treatment. But uh, just, a, I think, very important uh, take-home point is that there are, we can cure this. And the big difference between HIV by itself, that we're talking about cure rate in about half of our patients. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, transition to the newly approved drugs um, for hepatitis C. And those are telapavir or Incivic and bosapavir or Victrolis. These were approved about a year ago. And very important point, these are only approved in HIV-negative patients with genotype 1. Um, and it's also only approved in adult patients. Um, patients can be treatment naive or have already uh, received interferon-based therapy. Incivic is uh, dose 750 milligrams, three, three, uh, actually Q8 hours. That's a, I think there's a, a typo there. It should be Q8 hours, not uh, TID. And it needs to be taken with at least 20 grams of fat. Uh, you would do the telapavir in conjunction with PEG and ribavirin for the first 12 weeks, and then you stop the telapavir with a, either another 12 or 36 weeks of PEG and ribavirin. So you start with triples, and then you back down to the old the treatment of PEG and ribavirin. And in addition to the interferon-type side effects, we see uh, a lot more rash, more anemia, and kind of rectal irritation or, or pain, which my patients have affectionately termed firea. Uh, those are all things that we can... Um, treat through, and uh, we've gotten really good at treating those, those side effects. So bosapavir or Victralis is likewise only indicated for HIV-negative patients at this point. They need to be genotype 1, 
It's uh, also um, can be given to treatment naive or patients who um, failed prior interferon therapy. It's given 800 milligrams TID, um, just like uh, telaprevir. And it needs to be given with a snack. There's not a fat requirement with that. The big difference between bosaprevir and telaprevir is that you start with just PEG and ribavirin for a four-week lead-in period, and then you add the bosaprevir, and it can be anywhere for an additional 24 to 44 weeks that you're giving all three drugs. So it's dosed a little bit differently. We don't see the rash with bosaprevir, but what we do is something we do see is something called dysgeusia or a metallic taste in the mouth, and quite a bit of anemia. So about 50% of patients on bosaprevir-based therapy do get anemic. So the other issue um, that we're seeing with these new drugs are significant drug interactions. We really didn't have to worry too much about the drug interactions with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, but since uh, both bosaprevir and telaprevir are metabolized to the CYP3A4 system, there are a couple of drugs we really need to keep a close eye on uh, because it has some um, major drug interactions. I think the most important on this list are the statins. So lovastatin, simvastatin, and anyone on telaprevir needs to avoid adorvastatin or Lipitor. And basically what happens is you just see more of the risk for myopathy in rhabdomyolysis. <clears throat> uh, some of our patients with HIV may be on rifampin-based therapy, so that actually drives down the levels of bosaprevir and telaprevir, and that's a, a no-no. Um, we often don't think about herbal medications, but the top drug there is St. John's wort, um, which is uh, an herbal medicine that can be used for depression, so that is contraindicated. Um, and some of these other uh, medications are not all that commonly used. Um, but I did wanna, do want to point out on the bisepiria list that are some older anti-seizure medications, uh, carmazepine, phenobarbital, and phenytoin. Those do interact with bisepiria and, and make it less um, efficacious. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to some of the uh, pivotal clinical trials um, that have uh, been discussed at some of the national meetings. The first is the telaprevir 110 study. This is in treatment-naive uh, hep C and HIV-positive patients. This uh, study was done in 60 patients. Um, they're all genotype 1, and they were randomized either telaprevir, PEG, and ribavirin, or triples, versus the standard of care PEG-related interferon ribavirin. And they had two different parts. The first part were in patients who were not currently on antiretroviral therapy. The second part were on patients who were on a very select ARV regimen, and those include uh, atripla um, or um, ad boosted amazanavir. So those were the two permitted ARV regimens. Uh, there's a, a key um, dosing difference when the patient was on atripla or afavirenz. You needed to use a higher dose of telavir. I think Dr. Spock pointed this out last week. Instead of 750 milligrams TID, you need 1125 milligrams TID, which can actually add quite a bit to the cost of of that medication. Otherwise, the PEG and, and ribavirin were uh, dosed according to package inserts. And this is just a, a graphic representation of the two, two arms, pretty simple. Um, everyone got a 12-week um, lead-in if they were on the, or 12 week of triples, and then uh, a follow-up of 36 weeks of, of the PEG and ribavirin um, if they were on the top of their arm. And uh, this shows the, uh, the, the um, SVR 12, so this was a, a negative viral load 12 weeks after stopping therapy. Remember, we talked about the gold standard is, is considered 24 weeks, so this is, uh, you gotta take this with a little bit of a grain of salt, but you see a very big difference in the overall um, SVR rates, going up from around 45, 50% on the right there to somewhere in the low to mid 70s. Um, and this is about where we have seen in HIV negative patients, so I think it's very, Encouraging, the other th point I want to make is that it didn't really seem to matter which ARV regimen you're on, or if you're even on it at all, they all did very well. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, side effects, um, the, the major d differences on the top of your arm were more pruritus, so around 40% of the patients reported pruritus, and uh, more patients uh, had anemia, and particularly anemia that required a blood transfusion, so t uh, around 11% in the top of your arm. And so just kind of give you a, um, a little background in, in the HIV negative patients, about 50% of patients will report some kind of rash versus around 20 to 25% in PEG-RIBA um, and around 5% in the um, 
registration trials had a, had a pretty severe rash. So this, this actually seems to be um, pretty good, uh, at least no, no additional side effect signal compared with the HIV negative population. Okay, I'm going to talk now about bosaprevir, and this is also in treatment naive HIV hep C co-infected patients. Now, I want to start out with a key drug interaction here, and this shows the uh, impact of bosaprevir on the levels of uh, ritonavir boosted protease inhibitors. And you can see that regardless of how you're measuring uh, the levels, whether it's CMAX or mean AUC or CMIN trough, uh, all of those um, protease inhibitors, HIV protease inhibitors, are down quite a bit, anywhere from a third to, to a half. So pretty significant drug in action there, and that's going to be relevant as we um, start talking about some of these studies. This resulted in an FDA uh, letter to providers that basically said you need to watch these patients who are on any kind of bosapivir uh, regimen in conjunction with an HIV protease um, and ritonavir. Should be watched very closely with regards to the HIV viral load and make sure there's no HIV breakthrough. So this is the um, randomization scheme. Um, again, these are genotype one treatment naive. Uh, pretty standard, they did a lead in. Um, and either they got a placebo or bosaprevir, followed by a full year of therapy with um, bosaprevir, PEG, and ribavirin. Um, what you see here is the SVR12 um, in the bosaprevir arm, shown kind of the green uh, uh, bar, 61% versus around 26% in the standard care PEG, ribavirin. So a very big difference there, around 30 to 35%. And I think it's very, you got to be really careful when you compare telapivir to bosapivir. Um, remember the, the SVRs for that, that group was around 70%, but the, you got to look at the PEG ribavirin arm because that was around 40% in that study, and it's only 27% in this study. So both of them boost SVR around 30 to 40% is the bottom line. It didn't seem to uh, really af affect that much uh, uh, what kind of uh, ARV they were on. Um, so you can see adazanivir did very well, raltegavir. Um, I think there were some small numbers there. Uh, it accounts for some of the perceived uh, less of a difference. Okay, in terms of AEs, uh, main difference would be that they used more EPO uh, in the bosepravir arm, so 38% versus 21%. Um, and, and there was a little bit more study discontinuation in the bosepravir arm. I think a lot of that was driven by anemia. And also the neutropenia, so 27% had uh, at least a grade three or four uh, level of, of ANC. Now here's the key point. We looked at HIV breakthrough in the study. Overall, there were seven patients who had breakthrough, and four of those were in the PEG riba group, and three were in the Bosaprevir group. And when, at least when I was um, uh, seeing this presentation, the concerning thing was that those three patients had excellent adherence to their ARVs. Um, and had pretty significant breakthrough. These were not blips. I think they were viral loads well over 1,000. Um, and so that was very concerning, and, and that's led to this real concern and, and caution about using any kind of uh, bosapivir regimen in a patient who's on ritonavir boosted PI. So here's the, the bottom line. If you have a patient who is HIV positive, not on therapy, you can use either drug, bosapivir or telapivir. Raltegavir is pretty clean. Um, I, I didn't show you this data, but there is at least enough data uh, in bosapivir that it looks like you could use that or telapivir. However, if you have a patient who's on um, boosted adazanavir, you probably want to stick with telapivir and, and avoid bosapivir. Any, any patient who's on a atripla or a fovrins based regimen, you can use telapivir, but again, you have to uh, bump the dose up to 1125 milligrams every eight hours. In should not use bosapivir in that group. So the take-home points um, are that the interferon-based therapies have significant side effects, but I think we're pretty good at this point in, in managing a lot of those side effects. Um, it, getting a cure is possible, even in our HIV patients, and it just really requires a team effort, a lot of close monitoring and uh, intensive support. And you just need to stay tuned because uh, just like in the late 90s, early 2000s, when HIV was changing quickly, we're kind of in the same setting. And really, I think the um, exciting thing for a lot of us who treat Hep C is, is uh, trying to get to interferon-free regimens in our co-infected patients. And those studies are, 
uh, just about to enroll um, or we're getting just preliminary data back on. So I'd be happy to take any questions at this point.